Hi, everybody. We got a special program for you here today. I am Hody Johns, and I'm going to do the We're Libertarians Daily, but we also have... Dale Melchin with Simplistic Advice. Awesome. So uh, just to let you know, you've heard Dale on the show briefly before, uh, but Dale is a good friend of mine, a longtime listener to the show, and he's got his own podcast. Uh, now, why don't you tell us about, about Simplistic Advice a little bit, Dale? Well, it's a... It's very tough for me to describe it because it's a very, I don't want to say it's general interest, but I, I think when I came on, um, when I came on that other wall daily, we, or is it Loki wall or which one, or if it was even a real wall. Um, but um, uh, where's it, uh, there's a team of scientists still trying to work out what that was. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, some might say it is an act of rebellion from what I, I heard the other, on the other show. But anyway, right. um, it's a, it's a podcast that's focused on libertarianism from a personal perspective. In other words, trying to, try to maximize liberty from a personal standpoint without getting t entangled in politics. And that, that starts with, you know, freeing your mind, educating yourself, um, you know, basically trying to break free from the different things that, that bind us that aren't necessarily in the, that aren't necessarily in the political realm. Um, not that I shun politics. I'm not a, um, I'm not one of those libertarians, but, um, I've found that focusing on the things that you can control, uh, in your own life and the things that you can influence are oftentimes the best path to the best path to success and well being. you might say. And, um, uh, We've, I had a back catalog and I kind of, I rebooted that recently with Crisis of Infinite Podcasts. Uh, for any of you DC fans out there, you'll know what that is. And then I did a brief primer on my diabetes journey. And then my second episode, my official second episode, I kind of phoned in just to kind of demonstrate the importance of slogging through it, even if you're, even if you're tired. But um, that's been kind of the focus, starting with some of my health stuff and then, um, kind of working it out towards, you know, the different areas, finance. Not, I'm by no means an expert or a guru. Uh, it's more sharing the journey, but that long-winded explanation is what Simplistic Advice is. Oh, and one other thing, I'm sorry. Uh, and the joke behind that is when I would give advice when I was younger is that my advice is often simplistic, and that's just a dog whistle for, that's too hard. Anyway. <laughs> so what's the – why would someone – turn to you for advice as opposed to Dr. Phil, their coworkers, their mom, their dad. What 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 does the Dale offer? Wow, hitting the hitting with the with the serrated edge. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think it's just relatability. Um I'm down on the ground in the trenches working through the um working through the daily struggles of life. Um you know, some of the stuff that I've, I, I ferreted through a lot of Dr. Phil and, and stolen things from his toolbox, but um, a lot of the stuff that I try to use seems to be battle tested. I have a lot of intensity that comes with, um, with my personality and my, um, my brand to use that word. I don't know if that's a, that's a good word to use, but I think that would be, that would be the, uh, the key selling point. I do draw from different traditions. Um, I like Jocko. Um, I steal things from his toolbox all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm obviously not, I've never been in the military service, but I try to take what works and fuse it together if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I, I think it absolutely does. Obviously, you and I being chums, we've talked about things. I've turned to you for advice before. I think there's a lot of bad sources to get advice in this day and age. And most of the advice I feel is comforting. Let me offer you something that makes you feel better in your bad situation. And one of the things that I liked about the goal, I mean, right off the bat on your very first podcast was to to dry, to say it's time to get out of there. Like you, you mentioned the intensity, but, but almost the militant, whatever situation you're in that you want to change, let's let, you know, uh, you mentioned coaching and sports and that's 90% of the time when I like to use an analogy, I love sports analogies. I have to force myself not to use them for my non-sports fans. Uh, but, but you know, when, when you're coaching yourself, you know, you're not saying, Oh, it's okay. You blew coverage this time. It's like, man, you blew coverage. Here's what happened. You don't need to ruin your life, but here's what you got to do from now on. 
And I find that 90% of even people who care about you and your friends want you to be comfortable to say, oh, it's okay. You look coverage. You know, it happens to everybody. I don't see why. What's the big deal? Don't worry about it. Uh, I mean, do, do you get that feeling when you see advice around the world as well? Yes and no. And this is actually, if you don't mind me sharing a personal story um, while we're going into that. Um, <laughs> no, I wanted I, it all to be professional. I, I, let's, <laughs> absolutely no personal feelings on this program. Okay, fine. <laughs> No, you're good. Go ahead. I can see this is going to be a great, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, one of the things that I had struggled with for a, for a really long time was um, self-loathing, beating yourself up to put it that way. And, you know, there weren't close calls, but um, I always found it tough for me to like, with the concept of extreme ownership, um, which is one of Jocko's things is how do I take ultimate responsibility for my life? Cause I believe I'm a libertarian. I believe very much in personal responsibility, but how do I take that responsibility and, um, and apply it to the nth degree without crossing that line into, into beating oneself up. And, and there is a place for, um, we messed up and not, and not so much in the sense of comfort to the point of where you let yourself off the hook, but comfort to the point of like, we're human. We make mistakes. We like you talk about blowing coverage, which is that football? That's football. Yep. <laughs> Cause I, I watch football, but I don't get into the weeds on, on the different, uh, on the different tactical aspects of it, but learning to hold yourself fully responsible without crossing that line into beating yourself up. And that's only been something that, that I've really grasped onto recently is no, it's not okay, but at the same time, you're going to be okay. And if you take control of this, it will be okay, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. There's a to be able to say, hey, I think you have the talent to do this. You didn't live up to your talent this time. I think it's something that's extremely comforting. The person knows you well enough to say you're better than this. And that should give you comfort to say, okay, I'm good. It should reassure you as a person. There's something that I've found in, in this drive. A lot of times people say, well, why should I turn to you advice? You're a, you know, I'm a middle income by all accounts, normal kid. But I, I find that I have, when people who know me know that I have a lot of joy in my life, I'm very happy. I am very satisfied and that is hard to get. And a lot of that has come with being able to control, feeling more in control of my situation. And it's easy to blame everything else around me. But I find that just generally speaking, and you can, I want you to chime in and, and lend your expertise on this. But for me, generally speaking, people that blame all of their environment, blame everything on all the stuff they can't control and their focus is continually on things they can't control are very depressed and very unhappy. Whereas I accept that there are some things that I can't control, but I try to maximize the amount of control that I have. As a result, I have everything that I want. I don't want I shouldn't say, obviously, do I want a million dollars? Yes. Do I want it to the point where I'm sacrificing X, Y, and Z? No. And so I've made that calculated decision. So in my life, I have everything that I want, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. so I have, I'm very happy because I've taken those controls and not really shifted everything on everybody else. So what would your expert opinion say about that? <laughs> my expert opinion? Um, yeah. I, I, agree with you. I agree with you on that because you have to take a calculated risk. I mean, if you want the million dollars, then you know obviously there's process to it you're not gonna you're not gonna just sit down and be like it's gonna happen tomorrow but then you you have to set your life up in such a way that you're going to get it um i i find that yeah every every time i've encountered somebody that doesn't take responsibility or or wants to blame others blame everything as the reason why they're not successful there may be there may be proximate causes if you're trying to analyze it objectively, but you can't let that be the thing that trips you up to the point where, to the point where you're just not willing to do anything. That, that would be, yeah, that would, that would be, that would be another line that you don't want to cross is you're, you're blaming everyone and everything. You have to find out, okay, you might've had a toxic relationship um, or you had somebody that screwed you over stay away from people that screw you over and stay away from toxic people. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Well, and, there, and, the, and that's really a journey. I think that there's a certain amount of, I can't, con- like, like I do believe that there are some people when you have an addiction, you say, I can't control myself around this right now. But I think you can also then say, I need to get myself in a position where I can control myself around this. You know, it's not like, it, I think people are so binary about it. And they're unwilling to take the journey. They just say, well, I will never be able to handle eating, you know, just overeating. I'll never be able to handle eating like a normal person. Like, I just can't right now. It's like, okay, well, why don't you take a few steps in that direction as opposed to just say, I'm going to become a perfect person my very next meal. I mean, it's just so unrealistic. That's not the way your human brain works. Well, a lot of times it's negotiating with yourself. Um, Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot and again speaking of toolboxes that i steal from he's one of them as well so hopefully i didn't alienate you know everybody on the far right and left would say he is a toolbox but that's them because they hate everything jordan peterson well on the far right i figured all the righties would like him no no in fact um the the kkk he said some really anti-racist stuff and uh the a very anti-xenophobic talking about people that aren't comfortable around foreigners and how ridiculous it is to, to dislike immigrants. And it's funny because they say, Oh, I'm sure the far right loves him because he talks about, you know, normally because he like, he normalizes what a prejudice is, but he also doesn't validate your prejudice. And he went hard on that. And so, yeah, the racists have a problem with him, but, but go ahead. The, okay, uh, the Jordan no, I, I wanted to get that. I just want to get that joke in there. Um, sure. <laughs> but one of the, you have to negotiate with yourself. So you can't just, if you're, if you've been not taking care of yourself for however long, you can't expect to go run a marathon and not keel over. You have to start with small, with small and incremental steps and then work towards a run. So with eating, for instance, um, we'll probably get into this when we start talking about, talking about the keto journey. Um, stop eating bread. That would be one thing or, 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 I mean, in my case, just from my own personal journey, and I wasn't ever, I don't think I was ever a clinical alcoholic, and actually, I wasn't ever a clinical, yeah, this is the this is what I was saying, not a clinical alcoholic, because I didn't go to meetings, but, um, you know, I was 260 at my heaviest, overweight, and um, not physically active, and I'm like, oh, gee, why am I so fat? And then I started to cut down on my drinking, I got turned on to, to keto and primal, and said, all right no more drinking until I've hit my weight goals. And then magically, and I hadn't made it very many other alterations, I started slowly losing weight. And then I'm like, okay, no more bread. And then it started flying off. Now, Chris Pratt, who is quite handsome, he said drinking is the one thing. He just stopped drinking and then immediately became handsome. People hardly <laughs> remember season one, the Parks and Rec, where he was the fat guy. Right. It's just like after that, I just stopped drinking and then – Got handsome. So that's a great place to start, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what? Fat guy, handsome's handsome, whether you're fat or not. I mean, you know, when I was 260 at my heaviest, my wife still said I was handsome, even though, you know, the big tub of lard. But um, what I'm getting at, what, what I was, what I was going to get at is at that, you know, stop eating bread, stop eating candy. And then I wasn't even really doing much physical exercise and I was fighting diabetes, which I talk about, talked about that. You know, it just was taking control of that was what enabled me to, you know, to get to 285 at my lightest. Now I've, and not to renege on responsibility, but blaming the holidays, I've been on a yo-yo since then, but I'm still monitoring it, still taking the steps. And that's the, that's the point is you have to analyze the externalities, if that would be a word that's applied and, and try to dodge those or work with those that, Well, you also, and you're always very good about owning up to your failures. You're kind of my accountability buddy. And and so whenever you say- I'm honored, Hody. Yeah, whenever you say, you know, I've been having problems with this, that, or the other, you know, you have somebody to talk to about it. And I think you're very, when you say you're yo-yoing, I think people, like you say, you blame the holidays, but you blame yourself around the holidays. You Mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? And there's a huge difference there between saying like, well, there's the holidays, so it's just impossible versus- I didn't do very well during that season. Uh, these are the reasons I didn't do well, but but I know myself well enough. You know, I don't think we even got to get in. You and I are both keto-tarians, keto people. Uh, 
We and wait, no, stop. We we eat we don't eat not vegetables. We eat meat. Oh wait. Hmm. There was a whole confusion around the whole ketotarians and vegetarians thing. That was crazy. The keto apparently because we made so the ketotarians group starts. You and I are among the first two in there. Yep. Uh, libertarian for keto, and then we find out later after we make it, there's this whole book called Ketotarians about vegetarians that eat keto, that was already in existence. And so we had sorry my sorry about my dog. Uh, the anyway uh, the. <laughs> The, the keto group, so you and I are both keto adherents, but I think diet's a perfect example because there's many different diets that work for people. But I think people will write off dieting entirely because they just want to blame everything else. You know, mm-hmm. they'll just say, you know, I can't do this. My mom is heavy on the carbs. My mom is like a carb fiend and she is in crazy good shape because the thing is, is she also quick burns those quick carbs. She is active from the second she wakes up till the second she falls asleep. My girlfriend has lost over 100 pounds on intermittent fasting, and that works for her. So the thing is, you've got choices. And so I think when people say, you know, oh, I can't diet because I can't do this one thing. It's like, well, then choose something else. There's not one diet. There's a million different things that'll work. I think what you're lacking is that discipline. And really, that's the one fountain that you have to draw from in any diet is oh, yeah. a little bit of discipline. Agreed. hundred percent. Well, and sometimes, um, the, the idea of there being too many choices, that can also be something that hangs people up too. not necessarily, you know, you kind of got into the whole, well, I could never do that. Um, it's almost, it's almost schizophrenic in a way because you have on the one hand, you have so many choices, but then you have the person. And I think that stems for, from not taking responsibility, but also a lack of belief in their own ability, if that makes sense. Yeah. To, to get on the horse and yeah you can if you're running around i mean is your mama is your mom still an athlete or, or is she just so my mom <laughs> she is like a pickle pickleball superstar in her retirement community she, oh, wow. uh, she does the weight room she's big on art but yeah she uh she does dancing mm-hmm. um she's in a very very active retirement community they have like softball groups and She's just, whenever I take a vacation out there with my mom, it is, I come back losing a lot of weight trying to keep up with my mom because she's so, she's just so active (laughs) that it's hard to keep up with her. But like I said, you know, she found something that worked for her and she went for it. And I think, you know, that well of discipline, I was listening to a Cato Daily podcast and they were talking about where discipline comes from, how it's actually this area of your mind that has to be exercised, that has to be worked out, and that it has a finite amount of resources. So mm-hmm. if you're constantly there, if you're constantly around temptation and you resist the first temptation, you've expended energy from that area of your mind. And until you sleep and recharge and everything like that, it it's limited. So the so there is a there is also a structuring of your life that needs to happen to say, if I'm going to get what I want, you know, whether it's weight and I wanted to expand this idea way beyond diet, but whether it's jobs, goals, whatever your goals are in life, that there's a change in your life that has to happen where you say, okay, I need this discipline and I can't be testing my limits so often. So I have to get these things out of my life. Mm -hmm. I know for me and for many others passing up on a nice sandwich when you're on the keto diet is difficult because you just love bread. Wimp. Wimp. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you go full like carnivore, like all meat and you, and you take pictures and you send it to my inbox and you're like, look at all this bacon and eggs. No, uh, don't talk about that right now. Cause it's, well, I'm just going to out myself. It's land. I'm not supposed to be eating that. Hopefully my pastor doesn't hear this, but whatever. That's all right. It's uh, tofu bacon yeah totally yeah the you know and and so i think the thing is i just don't have it in the house you know and and my family's not keto so they have their own area of the fridge where i just don't look and i don't have it and it's not a temptation and my area you know i have the pre-done meals you don't have to pre-do all your meals but that eliminates the temptation and makes it less likely that I'll fail. So while some people look at me and just say, oh, aren't you the paragon of discipline? I've also had to do things in my life that make it so that I'm not constantly tangling with the devil every day. Right. You know? So yeah, the, uh, I mean, you are, you're a happy person. 
you got a nice, you got a nice gal, you got a nice life, but you're also a hustler and you work hard to make it happen. That's and I don't, hard. I think, I, I don't know of many successful people that have said, oh yeah, that came easy. I just, I mean, you look at the Forbes, what the Forbes top 100 richest people, almost all of them are first gen. Nobody's getting daddy's money anymore. The people who tried to get it easy ended up losing it all. And it seems like the hard workers are constantly making the list. That's true. I mean, I'm not by any means a millionaire yet, but you know, when you're, you just have to get after it. You have to have a, you know, you, you talked about the militant drive. I mean, you have to have, you have to have a little bit of crazy and a fire in your belly and you don't get that without, without a little bit of crazy. I'm not trying to go in circles here, but uh, you know, you, and you have to expose yourself. I think the other thing is you have to expose yourself. If you can't get it, in your local community, you have to expose yourself to other people that are doing the things that you want or that are a bit ahead of you. Like I have an entire, I have an entire playlist. And this is just, this is just a practical. I have an entire playlist within Stitcher that yes, isn't always the libertarians, but it's a, it's a section of self-improvement that has Tim Ferriss, Jocko Willink. Uh, I need to move Joe Rogan over there cause he's in the comedy feed. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm trying to th- think of some of the others. I'm actually, if you want to, if you want to talk well, for a second. Well, don't recommend too many people that aren't yourself either. I oh, mean, I'm sorry. You have, a, good, you have well, a great podcast. And like you said, I think one of the great parts about it is when you, you, have, you pull on all these people for information. I do. And then you bring it to your podcast. And I think that that is something that interests me because I don't have time for a million other podcasts, but I still need advice. I still need to grow. You know, me as a person, I need to grow. I need to develop. There's things I listen to on the podcast where I just, you know, for me, I don't settle. I'm a happy person, but I'm not really a settled person. I say, I want to do this project and I'm behind on this. And I listen, uh, sometimes I'll listen to a podcast and I'll hear myself say, um, and like, and I do that whenever I'm tired and I'm not in the zone. And I say, you know, shame on me. I need to stop doing that. No, not shame. You just need to stop doing it. Don't yeah. <laughs> I mean, I joke, I joke that shame is a weapon. Sometimes that's another thing. Um, and it depends on what you mean. Depends on what you mean by shame. Shame is a weapon. You direct it inwardly. You don't try to shame others and you use it very, you should use it very gingerly on yourself because you don't want to push yourself into the dark place. Cause we all have a dark place. I mean, whether yeah. you're clinical or not. Sure. Um, and what I was getting at is the practical that I was going to throw, throw to folks is if you have stitcher, just line up a bunch of different podcasts that, that have um that can be your how do i put it that can be your i don't want to say mental floss but your your mental detergent to help you stay focused and get ideas that sort of thing i mean that's one practical that you can do if you don't have folks around you so Not mental floss but mental detergent that's some high level philosophy dale i try <laughs> uh so so I, I, I find that myself uh, having to grow, I need somebody to bounce I- ideas off of. Obviously, you, you and I have that friendship and you've been that person to me. But I think people need to find somebody, you know, an accountability buddy or something like that to keep them in charge. One of the things that I like about um, people talk about the success of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. I think even if you're not an alcoholic, you take those steps and you say, I'm going to apply this to, to whatever it is in my life, you know, whether, you know, first admitting I have a problem, then, you know, holding myself accountable and then talking about it and then being honest with my failures and then talking about where I'll go. And then you create this kind of positive climate about it. Now I've never been an alcoholic, so I haven't had to do that, but I've had plenty of other struggles and problems in my life where I just said, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. You know, I, I mean, TMI, I had a huge problem with pornography when I was. Oh, geez, Hody. I know, I know. And I've recovered, but it was absolutely a problematic addiction that was drawing away from my relationships, that was taking away from my girlfriends, my marriage, you know, every, all, all this other stuff wrecking my life. And, it could, and, and, and again, 99% of the advice that I'll get, not to go back to the very beginning of what we talked about, was it's fine, it's natural, don't worry about it. You know, even professional psychologists, don't worry about it. You know, it's fine. Here's how you, nor- you know, let me help you normalize it. Let me help you rationalize it. And so few people that cared about me would say, you need to fix it and let me help you fix it. It's okay, I don't hate you, but let's, let's get over this. And I think everybody's got something like that. If you find yourself with like no imperfections, then think about the things that you want to make more perfect. 
Um, th- th- that's where I'm kind of at right now in my life. Not that I don't have some serious imperfections, but that I'm, I'm, I've, I'm trying to challenge myself and become better at writing, become better at podcasting, become better at talking about certain subjects. And, and so I have to make these sets of goals and really pursue them with a, with, with a kind of fervor if I'm ever going to achieve it. Otherwise, you know, I've got a whole world that says you could always just quit podcasting. It doesn't matter. You could always just quit your job. You'll find another one. Who are these people and where can I go so we can beat them up? <laughs> oh, wait, it might be a violation of the nap, but they could be violating the nap by discouraging you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the passive aggressive principle, the NAPAP. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's fun. I hope I haven't. I hope we haven't completely wrecked it with all the joking around that I've tried to sleep, that I've tried to slip in. But uh. no, it's good. I need to do more of that. So one of the things that I've challenged myself right now, and I'll just tell you on air, is I have been trained formally to talk about politics. I know I'm good at it because that was my speech and debate history, and that's what I've dedicated my life to doing. But I need to be able to talk about culture. And I have a problem doing it verbally. I can do it when I write, but I can't do it verbally without turning it into politics. And one of the whole reasons I even joined the Weird Libertarians Network is I got sick of fighting the political culture. And I wanted to, or, you know, the political climate. I, I, I wanted to change culture. I wanted to say, I need to change the way people act and the way they organize their communities first before I'm ever going to have a substitute. Subst- sub- substantive change in politics. So I need to talk about culture, but I'm bad at it. And I, and I have a tough time getting there. And so that's kind of where I am at right now is I need to learn and train myself to be able to say, okay, you're talking about culture right now and, and don't reach for the cookies, which is in this case, politics, which is where I just naturally want to go. I'm just like, is I got, I, is there, is there a cookie jar off camera here? That you're no, that'd be too much temptation for me. I can't okay. have it. I can't have it. <laughs> well, one of the things, Hody, and I, I, I have a similar problem um, because I'll just talk about the, the traffic. T- if you don't mind me bringing up the traffic ticket, not the ticket. It's not a ticket. It was a warning that I got um, the other day. Broke no laws, at least not in, in our world. I, mm-hmm. I damaged no property. I killed no one or hurt no one. Still got pulled over, still got a warning for a headlight that was out, and then I allegedly could not produce the um, produce an insurance card, which was completely lame, and it's currently a borrowed vehicle, so I'm to blame for not asking the people who I borrowed the vehicle from uh, for the proper insurance card. We'll, we'll put it at that. Okay. But the point that I'm making is, there's so much intertwined. My, my point in saying that is there's so much intertwined between politics and culture, unfortunately. Yeah. And so it's, it can be tough to not cross that blood brain barrier between, between the two, because you start pulling on a thread, you go off, uh, you go off after it. So, and then you go off camera apparently. Yeah. Well, I, that was just trying to, <laughs> no. trying to, trying to be funny with the camera there, but you know, it's, cause so much of it's intertwined and I don't know if that's like, if that's been a thing, has has it always been so interspersed or has there ever been a clear line between politics and culture? I think, I think politics has been eating things. I know for me, I love economy. I love studying economy. And it's funny when you read economists pre, I mean, governments have had something to do with economy for a long time, but it's funny to see economists and their element have nothing to talk about when it comes to politics. They're just like, Mm -hmm. here's how resources get allocated and let's talk about that. But your modern day economist has to talk about politics. You can't avoid it. It's impossible. So much of the cultural problems that we have absolutely derive from government tribalism and institutions and this the systems. But we need to be able to separate the two and be able to say you don't need the government to tell you to have a good culture. You don't need the government to tell you, you know, to tell you how to fix this problem. I think we look at these problems, we automatically look for a solution. The easiest solution is put a, you know, is government without the realization that any government solution is putting a gun to your neighbor's head and forcing your neighbor to do it for you, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, and it's tough to think about, especially if you, you haven't been raised in the libertarian mindset, Mm -hmm. but it's, 
it's still something that I want to be able to say, okay, libertarians, let's still go- live our culture in the best way possible without addressing politics. Because I think the more we say politics, 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 the more people still turn to that for the answer. You dog whistled a politics show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just, no, that's the name of, that is actually the name of, of a politics show, politics, politics, politics. Oh, Really? Oh, yes. okay. I'm not, I don't want to keep yeah. promoting, but I, I, I'm coming <laughs> outside, but you know, I just, I thought that was... That uh, could, uh, I can't even passively do it without talking about politics. Look at no, this. Code, I got a problem. <laughs> you got a problem. You need to stop hitting the politics bottle. Yeah. Oh, here's what we should do for a gag if we ever, if we ever get to meet in person. Um, uh-huh. We should have like a bottle that just has politics on it. You take your last swig. Uh-huh. It's full of water for you, obviously. Yes. And then you, you pour it down, you pour it out, and you smash the. Obviously, make sure people are okay with you doing that. But then, you know, smash the bottle against the rocks. And like, no more. <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I I have a tough time with we're going to. I, I think I have a tough time where I haven't developed, and this is why I'm talking about development with you right now. Right. Is for me it's so it's too simple like all i can talk about with culture is like love each other be nice to each other there are people who have dedicated themselves even within the libertarian movement that are good at this that talk about community and talk about that history there's a deep rich history to talk about with culture for me it's just i don't know whatever seems good and that's the problem that i have right now is i do need to work on it train on it read on it and I need to actively fight my brain, which says, pick up this economy book, pick up this political <laughs> book, read me instead, Hody, you'll like me. And, and, and instead, I'm just like, what is this hippie nonsense culture book? I don't need this. I just do whatever <laughs> feels right. <laughs> yeah. That's well, how I, well, we share a similar vice because that's how I feel uh, oftentimes, uh, especially if I'm teasing my, uh, my SJW friends, I'll be like, something like i'll say something like community is evil everyone needs to do everything on their own and you have to wait until you can't do it to get somebody else's help and then of course on the face of it that's absurd but you know the the capitalist inside me is screaming when you say that (laughs) uh well let's uh let's wrap it up let's talk about some final thoughts um obviously uh i i guess i'll start and i'll end with you uh, check out Simplistic Advice. Check out We're Libertarians. You'll hear this podcast on both of them. Uh, Dale's a good pal of mine, and if you don't have a good pal in your life, find one. Find somebody that cares about you enough to change you in the ways that you should be changed, I think, is where I would go with it. It is so easy to make a lot of comfortable friends and get in that. We talk about the echo chamber of politics. You can absolutely have an echo chamber of your own personal character. You know, you want to hear people reaffirm you and we train ourselves from a very young age to to say things that make other people happy and people are happy when they're reaffirmed now i'm not going out there and say be a douche and correct people that aren't asking for it and hold up a you know god hates gays sign at a at a parade you know please please don't but you know it, we're talking about the cha- the healthy change and find somebody that cares about you but still encourages you to make healthy changes and that's that's where my final thoughts are, Dale. How do you want to how do you want to kick off? Uh, my final thoughts are um, take baby steps. Be the lobster that jumps out of the uh, that jumps out of the boiling water and gets away. Um, to reference Jordan Peterson, um, and to steal from Jocko, just get after it. Find one thing and start chipping away and hit critical mass. Simplisticadvice.com. Um, there's still some we're, there's still some issues with with the website obviously but don't let that stop you you can still hit the play button we're only three episodes in but you'll find something very soon that you'll enjoy we'll square that up then awesome dale it's been good talking to you man you have a good day yep you too <laughs>